showing you his salvation. He is glorious. He is faithful. He is our loving Savior. Jesus Christ is his name. Hallelujah. Let the overflow be more than we even expected. Fill her, God. Glory. Don't move. Don't block the move of the Spirit. You're filled with God's glory. You're filled with God's anointing. That deep-rooted ball goes now. Hey! Today I've titled this message, Jesus the Serpent Crusher. In thinking of uh, just this Christmas season, and we think of Jesus born in a manger, we think of Jesus being the Lamb of God, and as I told you in a previous message, he's the Lamb of God, but he's also the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He's also the Lion of the tribe of Judah, and, he pray, and our praise is shouting out the praise, which is our victory, because he has delivered us. He has delivered us from shame. He has delivered us from fear. He has delivered us from death. He has delivered us from sin. He has delivered us, and he has translated us into the life of his son. We, he, we've been translated. We've been translated into the light of Christ. In Romans chapter 16, 20, it says that the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. I want you to make that stomp. You're stomping because you are reminding yourself that the God of peace, Jesus, is our peace, that he will soon crush Satan under our feet, under your feet. Amen. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 27, it says, For God has put everything under his feet. Every single thing that you may ever encounter that is of a demonic nature is under the feet of Jesus. And we know, according to Ephesians, it's also under our feet. It is also under our feet. When you look at the Bible in Ephesians 1, 22, it says that, God gave Jesus to be the head over all. So Jesus is the head over all things in the church and to the church. So not only are all things under his feet, but he's also been given to be the head. So in other words, authority, all authority and all power has been given to Jesus. And we know that the word says he's given that to us. We have the delegated authority, right? Amen. So Jesus Christ, our Messiah. He's our Messiah. He's the promised one. He is full of energy and he is the all effective God. So in other words, in Hebrews 4.12, and I took this from the Passion Translation. For what we have is the living word of God, which is full of energy. See, we're not used to hearing it in that version. It's full of energy, which means full of power. Okay, so the power of God, the energy of God, is living on the inside of us. And Jesus, born in a manger, came to us as the little, little child, Lamb of God, right? Filled with all glory, filled with all power, because that's not where his story began, right? That's just the Christmas story that we will read and we talk about, which is a beautiful story. But Messiah and Christ, they both mean the anointed one. So if you say Messiah, if you say Christ, Jesus Christ, it means the anointed one. Say it with me. Messiah or Christ is the anointed one. Jesus is God's chosen king. Amen. And we agree and we say amen. And so the word is Jesus. That's why we say we speak so much about the word and putting the word first. And so the amplified and version of John 1:14 Amplified, John 1, 14, this is what it says. And the word, which is Christ, became flesh and lived among us. And we actually saw his glory. Oh, it's possible. Yes, it is. And we experience his glory and we see his glory even in our worship services, including this morning. And we saw his glory as belongs to the one and only begotten son of the father. The son who is truly unique, the one and only of his kind, who is full of grace and truth, absolutely free of deception. Jesus is absolutely free from deception. And in the beginning, we know the word says, was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. John 1.1. 1, 1. But Genesis chapter 3, we know that Jesus is the word. He is the eternal word, and it will never, ever 
change. But Jesus, the serpent crusher, Genesis chapter 3, the serpent's lie that changed Adam and Eve's life. The serpent told Eve, you will not die if you eat of the tree that God forbid. But then the master deceiver went on to pervert God's word. That's what the enemy does. He tries to pervert, change, right, God's word. And he said, and you will be like God. The reason God does not want you to eat from that tree is because you will be like God. So there's a problem with this. Look at verse 5. For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. There, anytime the enemy wants to bring deception, he brings a little bit of truth and then he brings the rest of his lies. Right? What do you mean you will be like God? You already are like God. You already are created in the image and in the likeness of God. Do you see how he brought just a little bit of truth Oh, you don't want to eat of that fruit. When you eat of that fruit, you're going to die. They were supposed to live forever. And when you eat of that fruit, you're going to die. A little bit of truth. And by the way, you're going to be like God. He doesn't want you. Lie. You're going to be like God. He doesn't want you to be like him. No, no, no. Actually, you already are like God. Each and every one of you that are born in Christ are made in the image and in the likeness of God. You're not God, but you're made in his image and you're made in his likeness and his spirit dwells on the inside of you if Jesus is your Lord and your Savior, right? But there's a twisting, a perversion that was happening here. And we know the story that Eve took the bait and so did Adam. They both took the bait. So he says, and you will be like God, but they already were made in his image. So basically, the serpent, the snake, the enemy was questioning authority and causing her to put that seed of doubt, that element of doubt, which leads to deception and it leads to entrapment. Whenever the enemy wants you to, and he's trying to work against you, he will cause you to have uh, questioning authority, God given authority that has been set up in your life so that he can lead you to deception and entrap you. We see it happening right here, Genesis chapter 3. Do we all see it? So the beautiful Garden of Eden was their home. God walked with them and talked with them, but the serpent lied and he entrapped them. And once a lie is believed, I think we can all agree, it is sometimes harder to believe that individual because the element of doubt now exists right so here we have Adam and Eve and they just heard the serpent and they just took the bait of the serpent and the enemy entered in that spirit of lies and deception entered in so now they're thinking differently they're not a pure vessel anymore they're thinking a little differently they feel slimed now they're thinking a little differently they feel like they have to hide they feel like they have to run away from God when God always says no I want you to run to me right so stay with me now. It's all going to make sense. How is she going to tie this into the Christmas? You're going to see it in a minute. Just stay with me for a moment. So deception, rebellion, perversion. The serpent would be cursed more than any other beast of the field. And we know the Bible says he has to crawl on his belly and eat the dust. Praise God for that. Glory to God. But we know that weeds grow. And we know that creatures die once this happened right so the lie is is that people feel they have to run away from god people feel they need to run away from his goodness from his kindness instead of just coming straight to him and saying i messed up forgive me lord i messed up lord i know that you're a good god and this is the problem most people don't know that he's a good god their understanding of god is based on who's been modeled in their life and that is not always a good model. And so sometimes that model is so distorted that they think God is like their natural father. And instead of running to God, they run away from God. And they keep trying to hide whatever it is that they did. But God says, I don't want you to do that because I've sent my one and only son. And you're already forgiven. Just look to me, saith the Lord, right? So but he had to teach this to Adam and Eve because obviously God knew he's going to send his son. Jesus Though he was with God in the beginning, right? He was with God in the beginning because he is God, right? But here on earth, who was walking in the garden with them? Who was walking? God was walking, right? In the garden with them. So we, we know that he was going to send his son, right? In the future to resolve this problem that was created. See, Satan thought he had won when he tricked Adam and Eve. 
He thought he had won. He thought that it was all over, but he was wrong. Say, he's wrong. Look at verse 9. The Lord called to Adam and he said, where are you? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. First of all, sin will open up your eyes to the to layers of of sin and it'll open up your eyes to um, to impurities because you see he didn't even know that they were naked before that and now all of a sudden they know what they would not have known because sin opens yourself up to more deception and perversion and pollution so to speak right okay so he says I was running basically I'm hiding from you God I'm hiding from you but when you jump make a big jump go over to 15 because the Lord prophesies and he prophesied a curse to the devil in verse 15 in verse 15 he says he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel verse 15 I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed he says and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel jump back up to verse 13 the Lord said to the woman what you have done the woman said the serpent deceived me and I ate so the Lord said to the serpent because you have done this you are cursed more than all the cattle more than every beast of the field and on your belly you shall go didn't I already say that and you shall eat dust that's already been spoken of all the days of your life and then he says I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel the Lord prophesied a curse to the devil he says he will crush your head Jesus crushed the head what is the head it's the power it's what is it symbolic to the power is symbolic to authority right so he crushed and already prophesied God prophesied that Jesus was going to crush the head of Satan taking away his power of sin and of death that is the seed of the woman will crush the serpent's head who is the seed of the woman it says seed that means one seed an individual a specific seed referring to Jesus going to do this and we know that at the cross it was done right he says I will put enmity which means open hostility you know if as as a church body we, we, we really should be excited about what we hear is happening here because because you see this is what the devil doesn't want Christians to know they just want to they just want to okay let them celebrate Jesus in the manger go ahead and let them celebrate because we know that he ended up dying on the cross and we know that although he rose again there are so many people that don't follow him and are filled with deception let me tell you something that th that deception is only for those that want it because there's so much power and there's so much victory in over what Jesus has done for us he is truly the one that is crushing the serpent's head let me tell you he the, the his heel may be bruised but the serpents though the, though the serpent was allowed to crush his bruise his heel Jesus crushed his head he crushed his head that means authority and power has been destroyed and you know that whatever it is that Jesus has done he's also done it for us so that we walk in that same authority that's why we can get excited because this isn't just something that was done one time it done it was done for eternity in other words continues to be done so a heel bite compared to a head crush which one do you think is more powerful so the amplified Bible brings it out I think even more clearly it says and you shall only bruise his heel in other words hey there has to be a consequence like there's sin and we know that Jesus paid the full consequences right of our sins you shall only bruise his heel but he will crush your head glory to God so this passage points to the promise of Jesus's birth his redemption and his victory over Satan Jesus being born of a virgin is literally the offspring of a woman right and Galatians 4 4 says but when the set time had fully come see back in the garden Satan thought he won but when the set 
time comes. It says, when the set time had fully come, God sent his son born of a woman under the law. And in Isaiah 7, 14, it says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. There is nothing that happens that is, uh, has caused God to be questioning, what do I do next? His plan stands and he has one. So therefore, Isaiah 7, 14, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us, right? So Jesus being the son of man was the target of the devil's offspring. Jesus being the son of man was the target of the devil's offspring. In other words, evil men, demonic forces who like a snake, they, they, lie, they lay in wait for the savior to strike at him. That's what they were doing. What do you think was happening at the cross? They were waiting for their opportunity to strike at him. Now I'm going back and forth. I'm going from the creation of time, talking about the birth, I'm talking about the cross because it all ties together. That's why. It's not just, these are not isolated, you know, events. They all work together. So Satan was like, okay, here he is, the promised seed of a woman, which was spoken of in Genesis chapter 3. But now he is on earth and he is walking amongst men. Now we see that we're about ready to push him over the edge and kill him, right? He's saying now we're, and he thought that the victory was final when he was, when he had him die on the cross. Men did not kill him, Satan did, the devil did, but he didn't really because he rose again, right? They only thought they did. So their, their venomous conspiracy condemned Jesus to be crucified. And in that, they thought they were victorious. Their venomous cons conspiracy, they thought they were victorious in condemning Jesus to die. But, oh no, not our Lord. Uh-uh. Destruction of demonic plans. I love this because the serpent's strike did not achieve its purposes. Though the serpent did strike, and, and though the serpent does try to strike in your life too, it will not achieve its purposes. Okay, there are a lot, of, a lot of ways that you could even list right now that the serpent has tried to strike you, your family, right? Because you belong to Christ. If the enemy did this to Jesus, tried to, don't you think he's going to also try to do this to you, right? So just as the serpent's strike did not achieve its purposes, neither will it achieve its purposes today in your life. Because you are bought with a price, the blood of Jesus Christ. That same blood that Jesus ended up shedding on the cross for us that Satan thought he won was actually his victory and, and it was our victory. Amen? Because on the third day, Break, on the third day, breaking the power of death and winning the ultimate victory with the cross, Jesus crushed the head of the serpent, defeating him forever. Because you might say, well, when did he crush his head? But when did he crush his head? He crushed his head, which means the authority. It means the power. It means everything he thought he had, everything he thought he was going to be able to do. At the cross, when the enemy thought, he won, Jesus rose and showed him, no, you didn't. And for all times, you're going to be defeated and destroyed because nothing can come against the blood of the cross, the blood of the lamb. Nothing will be able to come against this one and forever work, right? It's final. It's forever. It's once and for all. So Genesis 3.15, the crushing of the serpent's head was a picture of Jesus' triumph over sin and Satan at the cross. You know, the enemy never could have imagined that, you know, years and years, centuries later, that he would have had this plan, God would have, to bring forth God's ultimate victory. He would have never imagined, never would the enemy have imagined what kind of a plan it was. Every time that en the enemy thought he had his way, God pulled he basically did a number on him and pulled the carpet right out from under his feet every single time. That's why the enemy is so frustrated. That's why, do you guys know that? He's frustrated. He's frustrated because, and who, he's, who is he really frustrated with? Not the world that already buys his lies. He's frustrated with on fire 
believers. He's frustrated with Holy Ghost filled, radical, like lovers of Jesus. He's frustrated with us because he's like, I don't know what it is. I keep throwing one thing after the next thing after the next thing, but they just won't take the bait. They just won't believe my work. I don't, it's as if they know something I don't know. Well, we do know something he doesn't know. We know that we are victorious. We know that Jesus' blood is enough. We know that the head of the serpent has already been crushed. And he already said in Romans 16, I already read it to you, the very first scripture that I gave you, that soon the Prince of Peace is going to do what? Crush Satan under his feet. Right? So what, what was the creation of time, what then became at the cross, the victory with the blood shed, right? What is right now, all of us applying that which was already accomplished for us so that we walk in it fully today. And then what's going to be, right? Because it's not over. Because we've, we have a glimpse of this eternal truth that God has given us. And he, and he tells us in his word, okay, listen, it was it is, and now it is currently, and it's going to be. In other words, victory continues to happen. You have a measure of victory, but it's not the fullness of it. Jesus' work is not, it's done, the final work of the cross, but working through us, it's still going to happen, guys. And it's happening right now. In other words, every single day, the things that come against you, you have the authority to defeat them because they already have been. They've already been defeated. It's really a understanding military and militant, like war. Just, just that militant, warlike image. Understanding this, but yet with the love of God, all laced through it all. Isn't that beautiful? John 12, 31 and 32. It says, now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. Because we know that he's the prince of this world. And it says, when I'm lifted up from the earth, when he's lifted up. He says, and when he was lifted up, he says, I will draw all people to myself. So Jesus was lifted up on that third day, drawing all people unto himself. But he's also returning, drawing all people unto himself. As he returns, more people that will see the truth and bow their knee to Jesus. So the striking of the Messiah's heel was a picture of the wounding and the death of Jesus on the cross. Satan, Satan bruised Jesus' heel, but Jesus showed complete dominance over Satan by crushing his head. God always has the plan of salvation in mind, church. And though Satan tried to usurp power, and he tried to change God's plan, God was way ahead of him. And God, he prophesied of Jesus, and he prophesied of Jesus as the serpent crusher victory over Satan and over all evil. Amen. And he said this in 1 John, in case you're wondering, where did he say this? 1 John 3, 8. And in 1 John 3, 8, he says, the reason that the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. The devil's work is destroyed. We are entering into this Advent season, and we know we're going to go through different aspects of who we are in Christ and the beautiful beautiful power and and the just the presence of God in us that we get to be the light of the world Jesus in us and and but I but I want you to remember we're entering into this season but remember the victory that was already won for us still stands forever and though you may see the in the in process you may see part of it today you may see part of the crushing of the serpent's head you may see part of that and you and you don't see the fullness of it you know that God is not a man that he should lie. So if he already said it, he's going to bring it to pass in your life, right? And so we are entering into such a glorious time of celebrating what Christ has done for us. We are entering into a time where we're going to give glory to the, and we do this every day, but you know, we love Christmas. How many love Christmas season in this room? Yeah, I love Christmas. It's just such a, it's just a beautiful time. And, and, you know, and, and so many people are aware, you know, of Christ and, and more now than at other times, right? But it is up to us, knowing the truth, like I just read to you, knowing the truth to make sure that in a world where it's so dark and in a world where they are trying to take Christ out of Christmas, and they've been doing this for a long time, this is nothing new, but 
But in a world where they're trying to take Christ out of Christmas, that because we have, we have the Spirit of God, which means we have the the serpent crusher <laughs> living on the inside of us, right? We have that which has been victorious. He's been victorious to literally crush the serpent's head, that kind of power, in inside of us, is living inside of us. So when you are going about and you see Christ trying to be removed from Christmas and you do see it just go to Macy's little kids pajamas you know and it just read really cute and it said Mary and I was in such a hurry I bought the pajamas and then I went home and then I you know put it on my my grandbaby and I saw it and I and I went what it just says Mary I said take them off <laughs> I said, take off those pajamas. I mean, we, you know, we can't return them. It's already cut and everything. But I said to her mom, I said, you know what? Before you get home, I want you to stop by the store. I need you to buy that puff paint. You know that fabric paint? I need you to buy that puff paint. Get it in white. <laughs> We're adding Christmas there. Are you kidding me? I can't return the pajamas, but I can alter those pajamas to be what they should have been in the first place. That's crazy. And normally I'm super, you know, like, observant of those things but sometimes when you're in a hurry these subtle things can slip by you but anyway we have the serpent crusher's power which is Jesus his power because he's already crushed the serpent under his feet and we know that he also continues to do so on the last day but we have that same spirit living on the inside of us so it means we have power on the inside of us. So when we celebrate Christmas, we celebrate Jesus. We celebrate all the aspects, and it's glorious, it's wonderful, and it warms our hearts. But it also reminds us of the warriors that we are in him. It reminds us that we are truly warriors for Christ. It reminds us that these warriors are already victorious. It reminds us that there is no lack and there is no need that we have that Christ has not already given us. And that he is not greater still. Amen. Now, Father, I thank you. I thank you that even as the serpent tried to lie to Adam and Eve, Father God, every lie is being exposed right now and turned right now to truth. Lord, let every lie be exposed. Lord, let the truth of who you are right now come into this room, into the hearts and minds of those listening to my voice. And I thank you that the truth of God prevails. I thank you that they are filled with the Holy Ghost. I thank you that the power of God is on the inside of them. I thank you that it's just one simple yes. We're not running away from you, God, like Adam and Eve were. We're running to you. Lord, we're going to run to the arms of Jesus. Lord, if any time we feel bad, we feel discouraged, we messed up, whatever it might be, Lord God, we repent, we get it right, and we run right to the loving arms of Jesus. Don't let the devil deceive you by causing you to feel bad and down, and then you stay in that pit. No, you weren't called to stay in that pit. You literally have the serpent crusher's victory in you. Jesus is the serpent crusher, and he lives in you. So you're going to stand up, you're going to rise up, and you're going to do the will of God today and every day. Amen.